Today, we have the pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sternberg uh, to talk about pilonidal disease. Um, and Dr. Sternberg, just as a background, um, he graduated magna cum laude from Pi Beta, and Pi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College um, and completed medical school at University of Chicago. He trained in general surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Center and completed um, a surgical uh, nutrition fellowship at Harvard as well. Um, he first encountered the cleft lift uh, approach for polynomial disease during his colonorectal surgery fellowship at the University of Minnesota, and then uh, deepened this understanding of the technique with John and Tom Bascom in 2001. And since then, they've partnered to further evolve the technique. And now Dr. Sternberg um, specializes in patients with challenging recurrences, and he's treated over 1,500 individuals and has less than a 1% recurrence rate, and has been able to fix those who have recurred. Um, and, it, and is referred um, patients from, from all over internationally. Uh, patients travel from all over the US, Canada, and elsewhere to San Francisco, where, his, uh, where the Sternberg Clinic is, um, and with challenging polynatal problems. Um, and since completing his colonorectal surgery fellowship in 2000, Dr. Sternberg has practiced general and colorectal surgery in San Francisco at the California Pacific Medical Center, where he served as surgical director of IBD Center and also as the hospital uh, medical executive committee. And so we are honored to have an uh, interna international expert in a disease process that leaves a lot of colorectal surgeons um, kind of scratching their heads or having and, and patients having, you know, um, frustrations with. And so we are uh, very um, happy and excited to hear about the, the tricks of the trade here today. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sternberg, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Tony, for that nice flattering introduction. Um, and thank you all for attending this. I hope it is useful. We're gonna talk about pilonidal disease, myths, truths, and pearls. Uh, my advancer is, oh, I see, I just click on it. So I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you, that pilonidal disease is not caused by a cyst. It is caused by the deep cleft and recurrence after traditional excisional surgery is greater than 20% at 10 years. Failed operations worsen the disease and are highly morbid. The cleft lift procedure, which I like to call the rotation and advancement flap procedure or the pilonidal raft, is a primary closure procedure that allows patients to return to athletics in around seven to 10 days. The recurrence rates are much less than 1% at two or more years. And I'm gonna give you some key technical pearls. During the operation, there's a planning phase, a mobilization phase, you eliminate all the dead space and you lateralize the closure. And I feel, strongly feel that this should be the standard of care in the treatment of pilonidal disease. So a word about terminology, I, the cleft lift procedure, the name which was given to it by John Bascom has always confused surgeons. So I think that the procedure should be renamed a more, in a more descriptive fashion. And the pilonidal raft or rotation and advancement procedure better describes it. I, I will use those two terms interchangeably throughout the talk. Let me start with a story. This is Daniel who came to me in 2007 at age 18 after four failed operations in three years. He's, he went through high school with this open wound. How he got through it, I have no idea. I performed the cleft lift procedure on him and this is Daniel two months later. So why me, why am I here? I started out doing the full spectrum of, of colon erectile and some general surgery. I became interested in pilonidal disease during my residency in Boston. I was taught by many talented surgeons but they were not talented in the treatment of pilonidal disease. And I was complicit in many terrible operations. I began as a generalist, as I said, and then when I finished my colon erectile surgery fellowship in 2000, I contacted John Bascom um, and he flew down to San Francisco and we did five cases together. And that's what got me started. I chose to specialize in pilonidal disease because very few surgeons had an interest in it and I believe that I can make a difference, which I feel I have. And I've never done an operation other than the cleft lift procedure since starting practice in San Francisco. Um, patients started to talk about it in, in pilonidal chat rooms and it kind of went viral. And in 2007, I wrote and designed an informational website 
um, and got much busier doing this. In 2017, I got busy enough doing this that I decided to stop taking call, go out on my own, and I developed a very black swan practice where 80% of what I do is pyelonidal disease. Most of my patients find me organically by viewing my website through search. Many patients are now referred by other surgeons and the majority of my patients travel from outside San Francisco or fly to San Francisco for my care as they're unable to find solutions for their recurrent pyelonidal disease locally. I follow all of my patients' outcomes and have a less than 1% reoperation rate. And those patients that I have reoperated on are cured. This is how most people, most surgeons feel about pyelonidal disease. So this is often how it presents is an acute abscess. And you know what to do here. You drain laterally, make an elliptical incision so that it doesn't, the skin doesn't seal right away. Don't pack these wounds, just allow them to drain and only give antibiotics if there's cellulitis. Sometimes they also present as a primary pyelonidal sinus. Um, hygiene is important. I don't advise shaving. There's little data to support this as it is not a disease of ingrown hairs. It's a disease of hairs that are shed that get into the wound. Um, I used to do pit picking. I, I don't do it anymore because it has a very high recurrence rate. And if it keeps become, if it remains symptomatic, consider a, lar a larger operation. So beware, what looks like a minor problem is it could, could have a much more major problem lurking under the surface. So you probably already know there's, there's likely a three to one male to female um, pr uh, proportionality in this disease. It occurs in um, sort of in the, it starts in the acne years as a teenager and can present as late as the 30s. The true inc incidence in the US is unknown. It's, this number is quoted in most papers, but in it, they all reference a 1995 um, Norwegian paper where they, I think that they just pulled this out of thin air because they didn't say how they came up with this number. In a more recent article published about Turkish military recruits in their population, where it's probably much more common than it is in the United States, 6.6% .6 of Turkish military recruits have pyelonidal disease. I don't think it's a disease of the obese and sedentary. Here are three of my athletic patients um, it, because many of my patients are thin and athletic. My average BMI is 27. What's the etiology? It's still somewhat controversial. It's not a cyst. The deep cleft is a causative factor. The pathogenesis is not exactly clear. There are three theories. Bascom came up with a follicular occlusion theory. Dietrich Dahl in Germany believes it's caused by direct hair insertion after haircuts. Um, I think it happens from repeat microtrauma from sitting. I haven't published that though. Um, and like, here's a patient of mine with primary pyelonidal disease. I mean, how does that wound develop? He's only 13 too. Symptomatic disease, I believe, rarely goes away without surgery. So the deep factor, the deep cleft is the causative factor. Before surgery, the deep cleft is moist and airless. It's a perfect environment for infections to, to fester. After surgery, there's a well aerated shallowed cleft and the incision is off to the side. Here's a patient of mine with a recurrent pyelonidal sinus. It looks like a cyst, but it's just an abscess. There is no epithelial lining. This is a cyst. This is pyelonidal disease. Um, it's an acquired disease by one of these three processes, and the deep cleft is the cause. So when Bascom's follicular occlusion um, theory, after puberty, hair follicles in the deep cleft become distended with keratin. Trauma likely contributes. A folliculitis develops and edema leads to follicular occlusion and the infected follicle ruptures into the subcutaneous layer and abscess develops and the moist airless cleft perpetuates the infection. Here is a secondary invader due to a vacuum that occurs when one sits down, their buttock cheeks spread apart and any um, holes in the natal cleft midline allow uh, hairs to insert and barbs and scales prevent the hair from escaping. Here are the, barbed, the barbs on, on, on the hairs. 
and they need to insert from their root end. So they need to be shed. And in Dietrich Dahl's um, yeah. hair insertion theory, it's shed hairs from the occipital scalp after haircut, after haircuts that gets inserted directly into the natal cleft midline. Well, I love it. And this is my repeat microtrauma theory. So it looks like a cyst, but it's just an abscess. So we need as surgeons to stop calling it a cyst. There's no such thing as a pilonidal cyst. I would just refer to it as a pilon as pilonidal disease or a PSD, which is pilonidal sinus disease. Um, the etiology is widely misunderstood. It leads to overaggressive treatments such as this that create large midline wounds and often make the situation worse. This is a patient of mine who flew out from New York City. This was this was one of his three operations before he came to me. You know, people treat this like it's a cancer. Wide excisions are completely unnecessary. There's no need to remove deep tissue. The deep tissue will heal once the infection is eliminated. Only remove skin to make the cleft, the cleft less deep and avoid wrinkly skin. Wide excisions create dead space. Wounds at the bottom of the deep moist airless cleft don't, don't heal. Um, and closure in the midline over dead space is even worse. So we learned this lesson in World War II when over 80,000 surgeons were treated with wide excisional marsupialization procedures for their pilonidal disease, which they called Jeep disease. It took four to eight weeks to heal, but 40% of the time it never healed. And it was eventually, these operations were outlawed by the, by the army. So why do we have to relearn these valuable lessons? We believe from extrapolated data from Europe that there are over 100,000 traditional operations performed for pilonidal disease each year in the US and the recurrence rate is upwards of 30%. That's a huge problem. Excisional surgery turns a small problem into a larger one. The impact of a failed operation is greatly underappreciated because often these patients don't return to their surgeons, they go to another surgeon. Excisional operations continue to be taught in training programs. And as far as I know, there are very few training programs that are teaching um, the trainees the cleft lift procedure. Few surgeons have a true interest in pilonidal disease and the treatment is often rele relegated to inexperienced junior faculty. The consequences of a failed operation too are underappreciated. There are economic factors such as missed work, transportation, wound care, missed school, missed athletics, social isolation, emotional trauma for the entire family and a headache for the surgeon. So in the words of Atul Gawande, as a surgeon, nothing is more threatening to who you think you are than a patient with a problem you cannot solve. I don't believe that small procedures are useful in this condition. You know, they usually involve midline procedures. They don't eliminate the, dead, the deep cleft picking, trephination and curatage, endoscopic polynidal sinus treatment. Maybe they have a role early in disease, but I don't know how any of those things are gonna help a patient like this. They're rarely curative. So here are two patients that I performed a polynidal wrap on. In the Cochrane Review of Polynidal Disease in 2010, they concluded that off midline closure should be the standard of management. And the superiority has been known for four decades from the work of, of Karadakis and Bascom, but this doesn't seem to have impacted the current surgical approaches. There's data for um, su supporting asymmetric closure procedures, but I must say that none of the data is really great, including my own, because they're really single case series. So asymmetric closure principles include shallowing the, shallowing the cleft, padding the sacrum, and aerating the cleft. You fix the cause by making the cleft less deep and aerating it, and closing the wound off to the side with minimum tension so the wound is in the open air and will heal. I don't perform either the keratacus or the rhomboid flap procedures. They both involve excising a fair amount of tissue, which I am opposed to. Um, and 
particularly with the rhomboid flap procedure, if it's not done in an asymmetric fashion, you end up with a midline wound that can lead to a recurrence. Plus, I think they're very disfiguring procedures. The cleft lift or raft works because it flattens the deep cleft, eliminates dead space, places the incision off to the sides, and I think is cosmetically superior. But the name has caused confusion. Patients come to me after a partial cleft lift, a modified cleft lift, a modified partial cleft lift, a Bascom II, and I think it, this confusion has led to poor adoption. That's why I think it should be renamed the pilonidal raft, a rotation and advancement flat procedure. The recovery is quick. Most of my patients are returning to athletics in 10 days. No wound care unless there's a complication. A minor wound separation occurs in around 20%, particularly in the recurrent difficult cases. But patients can sit right away, and there's a very low failure rate. So technical pearls, you need to start. You, the incision has to be the length of the cleft. and has to start above the cleft. You end up with an overhang that leads to a recurrence. Be careful not to miss the lowest hole. It's, it's often close to the anus. Mobilize a thin flap along the entire cleft. Unroof the abscess, score and infold the abscess cavity to eliminate dead space, but don't excise the abscess cavity wall. Sew the tissue under the surface to create a flat bed. Be aggressive in taking skin to lateralize the incision and don't be afraid to go too close to the anus. Sew from the anal end upwards and place the incision off to the side. This is the direction of flap mobilization. This island of skin will be removed. And this is the, um, the direction of the advancement of the flap across the midline and the rotation around the anus. Here's a patient who had a failed operation in Canada and an open wound for nine months. These are not minor procedures. When I first, when I first started doing these, I was wondering and terrified in the OR that I was gonna get the wound closed. But they do close. And then I sometimes, I, I always do what I call a buttock compression test, which I wanna make sure when I press the patient's buttocks together, um, that this wound does not end up in hidden, like in a new in a new cleft, and it stays in the open air, so it heals. So in 2018, um, Stauffer et al. published a meta-analysis. Now I must say, most of the data that went into this is not excellent data, but they did show that the cleft lift and keratacus procedures had the lowest recurrence rate of 0.6% at 24 months. And cystectomy with marsupialization had a dismal recurrence rate of 20% in 10 years. And if you closed it in the midline, it was almost a 70% recurrence at 20 years. This is my data on 923 consecutive patients over 14 years undergoing the pilonidal raft, 70% long-term follow-up, 90% were at full activity by week six and 100% by three months, only seven patients, 0.76% required a, recur, a, a, re, a repeat operation for failure. All are well to date. And the Kaplan-Meier curve show, that's flat shows you how durable these results are. So I think that this supports that the, lift, the cleft lift or the raft should be considered a standard of care in the treatment of pilonidal disease. The technical pearls of the pilonidal raft, the first phase is planning, the second is mobilizing and excising, the third is flattening the cleft and preparing the bed for the flap to rest on, and in the last phase, we, I place a drain, inset the flap, and close off to the side. So this is our patient I'm going to show you a video of. He's in his late 20s, he had two failed wide, whoops, sorry. He had two failed wide excisional operations in Tennessee. The first was open, the second was closed, but it, but it opened. He's left with a huge soft tissue defect and a chronically open wound. His BMI is 37. Always culture these chronic wounds because you'll find some patients have, um, have unusual drug resistant bacteria and he was absolutely miserable. This is what he looked like. The, it was really hard to get his buttock cheeks taped apart. He's lost a lot of soft tissue here. You can see the changes of his skin because of chronic drainage. Um, it's very challenging. I find it still very challenging to lateralize these incisions 
in patients who's, who have clearly lost a lot of, um, of their soft tissue from prior excisional operations. Okay, so this is what I call planning. I'm drawing the island of skin that I'm gonna be removing. And it always ends up being much larger than what, what I first draw. And almost always eventually, it ends up coming out like this. And this lateral incision usually meets the medial incision at a right angle before I close. Half percent bupivacaine with epinephrine. Uh, wait, how do I advance to the next slide? All right, here we go. So in this step, I make the medial incision and the, the details of the lowest part of the incision are not really decided until I'm about to close. They, it always gets revised. So you see that that top part of the incision comes above the cleft. These markings, um, the purple lines on either dotted lines on either side are where his buttock cheeks touched when he was standing prior to going to the operating room. So I'm opening up the incision and then, you know, and I, I make it fairly deep because I want to be able to get down to the abscess or the open wound. And then I make a shelf of tissue around a centimeter thick under the entire length of the incision because I want good tissue that'll hold sutures to sew to, but the flap ends up being much thinner than this. So I mobilize fairly widely, although I don't wanna to go too wide because if you go too wide, you can end up with a chronic seroma. And the most difficult part is the anal end of the dissection. You wanna take a portion of the subcutaneous external sphincter muscle, um, but you never wanna go make the anal end of the flap less than a centimeter, you can end up with some devascularization. So here I'm pulling the flap over and trying to figure out where my lateral, the lateral extent of my excision will be. And then I just remove the skin island trying to spare as much of the subcutaneous fat as possible. And a Wheatlander retractor after the tapes come off are very helpful for viewing the anal end of the, of the flap. Okay. So you can see it's a fairly sizable wound. This is, I did not excise the, um, the um, deep portion of that open wound, which actually lay directly on the sacrum. So I scrub it free of debris and then I cross hatch it so that it could be infolded on itself and all the dead space eliminated. And this is just real time, that's how quickly I, so this is done in multiple layers. This is a 2O maxon suture. And this is probably 20 minutes later in the procedure. Most of it is all the dead space has been eliminated underneath, but I'm creating a flat bed so that the flap will comfortably lay on this flat bed of tissue. And as you sew these layers together under the surface, it advances the flap and rotates it around the anus so that you can close laterally without being under tension. 
So see, I'm removing more skin because I found that I was able to. advance the flap over more. And now I'm trying to rotate the anal end of the flap. And I must say in this guy, I didn't get it as lateral as I, I'd like to, but you'll, you'll find that you only need to nudge that incision off to the side a little bit. And I think the, between that and the elimination of the dead space is why these procedures work. Okay, so um, I'm making my drain hole. I always tunnel the drain so you don't end up with a leak of serous tissue after the drain is removed. And I do use Expro, which I think has really helped my patients have minimal to no discomfort after the procedure. So I use a, um, a Blake drain. Uh, I found that JP's clogged. And in some of my photos, you see an old fashioned passive drain, which I use for a lot of years, but I've gone back to using a Blake drain, which I think is, has been helpful. So now the flap is, the incision is closed and the flap is inset into the tissue defect. And here I am using another 2O max on, on a smaller needle. And then I put in some intermittent 3O PDS sutures because I was finding that I had more wound separation when I went to Maxon because the Maxon sutures dissolve sometimes too quickly. And the PDS, I believe, is helping prevent some wound separations. So you, I hope you can appreciate that that wound is the, the midline anus is there, and this incision is going to be closed there. I think you have to be really meticulous about this closure. You can't rush through these procedures. These take me, a, a, you know, th his, this procedure took me around two hours. Um, easier ones take me around an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half. And I try and place these sutures around a centimeter apart. I also believe that the anal end of the closure is the most important portion of the closure. And that's why I start with it first. And then I close the skin, which is the final layer with a 2O strata fix, which is a, a barbed um, double arm suture. And there's my buttock compression test. Most of the incision stays in the open air. One inch stereo strips. Uh, because these wounds are always chronically infected and it goes against surgical principles to close them, I. I place patients on two weeks of antibiotics. I had to switch him to a third generation cephalosporin since he had ESBL E. coli in his wound, um, which was resistant to the augmentin I typically pay, place patients on. The drain has stayed in for at least a week. Um, it's removed when there were two days with less than 15 to 20 cc's of output. Once the drain is removed, I allow patients to return to gentle exercise and full return to exercise in a month. I think it's a game changer. This is not a procedure to rush through. The closure must be meticulous. It's usually curative and gives patients their life back. It's cosmetically superior to most other flap procedures. I find this to be very meaningful and rewarding work and you get good at this 
and you'll get busy because there aren't that many people out there that are doing this. And I have many grateful patients. I think it should be considered the standard of care, the board answer. So this is a testimonial written by one of the families that, sent, that came to me with their son. I realize now that not only did our son have physical wounds from pilonidal disease and four failed surgeries, but our family had emotional wounds from the suffering that the experience of six and a half years had brought us. Thank you for giving our son his life back. Here's a patient with a prior failed operation and you do a proper operation and this is what he looks like three weeks later. So this is a heartbreaking case. This is a 42 year old guy who had surgery in my backyard just 45 minutes south of San Francisco by a surgeon who I've operated on 12 of his patients now. This is what he looked like two weeks after his surgery. He was so emotionally traumatized, he waited another four weeks before he allowed me to operate on him. So this is what it looked like at the time of surgery. That wound was right on the sacrum. That's the sacrum you're looking at right there. That's what I had to do to sort of break up the tissue. And that's what it looked like after surgery. 10 days later, this is what it looked like. And you can see the incision is indeed off to the side, the midline anus is here. So if you do a cleft lift and it fails, what, what are the causes of that? You could have the wrong antibiotic and that's why I culture patients. Failure to lateralize the incision. Failure to eliminate all dead space, which I think is a huge no-no, which is what I think happened in this last case because I think that that surgeon tried to perform a cleft lift by watching my YouTube videos. If you miss the lowest hole, the operation is gonna fail. If you incompletely eliminate the cleft, it may fail. If you operate on patients that are too infected at the time of surgery, that could lead to failure. If it's really an anal fistula masquerading as pilonidal disease, it's gonna fail. And if you have, if you have germ, dermatologic pathology masquerading as a pilonidal, then the operation is probably not going to work. So, being an expert in pilonidal disease is very different from being a rectal cancer expert. There's really not that much competition, although there's getting to be more. Surgery is elective, so patients have the luxury of traveling to you. Most of these patients have a tough time finding excellent care locally. And I think it's important to be data driven. So I was labeled as an expert, first by my patients, second by my colleagues in the community, and academicians are still lagging behind. It's tough sometimes because you have to own all your own complications, especially if you're trying to institute change and make this the board answer. My views have been seen as somewhat controversial. I wrote a paper during the pandemic and it was rejected from DCR despite being the largest series of cleft lift procedures in the world literature. Two reviewers said that my statement, we as surgeons should stop performing excisional operations was arrogant. I've had academicians tell me that in order to, to make my claims, I really need to organize a randomized control trial. But I point out that there's never been a randomized control trial for TME. And we've made that the standard of care for rectal cancer. If you're gonna do this, you have to have a captivating website. So why has it been difficult to get this procedure adopted? I think most surgeons should be able to learn this. It's an, they need to have an appreciation of what patients and families go through. But it's not a see one, do one, teach one procedure. It takes time and experience. I believe in the 10,000 hour rule, because I was not ready to tackle the tough ones after the first 20 or so of them. It's kind of an orphan procedure. It's in no man's land. It's too close to the anus for most plastic surgeons to feel comfortable. Flat procedures are unfamiliar to most colorectal and to most general surgeons. And there is a learning curve. It helps to have an apprenticeship. And it's difficult to learn procedure, new procedures once you're outside of the training program. So I think I 
hopefully convince you that pyelonatal disease is not caused by a cyst. It's an acquired condition, but it, the causative factor is a deep cleft. Recurrence after excisional surgery is very high and failed operations worsen the disease and are highly morbid. The rotation and advancement flap procedure for pyelonatal disease is a primary closure procedure that allows patients to return to athletics in around 10 days. Recurrence rates are far less than 1% at two years. The key points are planning, mobilization, elimination of dead space, and a lateralized closure. It is the standard of care in the treatment of pyelonidal disease. Please watch more videos on my website, on, my, on the YouTube channel. And thank you very much for attending today. It wasn't quite an hour. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sternberg. That was really just um, an amazing overview of, of practice. And, and really this, as you said, it is a black swan practice and a niche that many of us really don't get a lot of exposure to during our fellowship year. And it sounds like that we should. Um, I, uh, I'm going to go through uh, the questions that people have put on the chat both on um, our Zoom session here and also on Surgeon. So if the um, participants or the viewers here um, have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so I'll just start from the top. Um, the very first one is from Dr. Coy Lee from Surgeon, wants to know, what is your uh, billing practice or CPT, CPT codes for the rotational uh, advancement flap? How do, you, how, do you, how do you bill it? So I bill three codes. There's 14301, which is for the 60, first 60 square centimeters of the flap. Um, then there's 14302, which is an add-on code. So you can build multiples of that. Um, and it's, I believe there you build a multiple for every additional 30 square centimeters. And it's important that you, uh, you know, this is a plastic surgical procedure. So you need to build like a plastic surgeon. So you should right. look at the description in the CPT book because, and it's important how you dictate this. So the island of skin that's removed is called the primary defect. And after the flap is mobilized, that's called the secondary defect. And you add them together for your total billable flap size. And then the last code is 11772, which is excision of complicated um, pyelonidal abscess. So there are three codes. Great. Um, Jill Pescia uh, asks, what layer of tissue do you place the drain? So where is the tip, the terminus of that drain, uh, tip of that drain? And then uh, is it right before skin closure? And how long do you leave it in for? I think you answered that you, you said it was one week for your drains, but where do you put the tip of the drain? Or where does it lay? So the, so the drain is directly under the flap. And the tip is, you know, is essentially the length of the flap. If you, you know, I found that patients are too uncomfortable if it's like sticking into um, the anal sphincter. So I cut it a little bit before then. Um, and it's placed right before skin closure. So I am pretty conservative about removing the drain. Um, I, you know, the earliest I remove it is at day eight. And I want two days in a row with less than 20 cc's of output, but I'm, I feel more comfortable if they have less than 15 or even some, sometimes even less than 10, because I have had some recurrent seromas um, and those are a pain to treat. They usually resolve on their own, but in a few circumstances, I've had to have interventional radiologists put a drain back in. Okay. I don't think that just aspirating them would be helpful. Great. A uh, question from Sir John from Dr. King Mullins. Uh, how did you decide to use Stratifix for the skin closure? Uh, I, I thought it would save time. <laughs> That's very well. And, and I don't actually even know if I need that layer anymore because, you know, the skin is closed so tightly when I'm done with my 2-0 on the smaller needle layer, um, but I'm afraid to change anything. I mean, people have asked me like, do you really need two weeks of antibiotics? I, I don't know, but I, I mean, I, I've only had one 
pace in, in recent memory get C. diff um, out of like probably 1800 patients by now. So I'm afraid to change my, my protocol. For sure. Um, just a comment by Dr. Avery Walker. Where can we find more videos? You could sell these to all the programs across the world. So I think he That's very amazing. appreciated. The so I'm on the YouTube channel, and I, I am going to be placing a few more videos on on the YouTube channel because I just finished filming. I, so. We'll definitely reference those. Um, Francisco Cardenas uh, asks, "How long to wait after acute septic control if there's active cellulitis? What?" So I guess how when would you do your your advancement um, flap um, after acute uh, infection and cellulitis, and then uh, what procedure would you temporize them with? So, you know, all of these patients have some degree of abscess, so that, that doesn't scare me. Um, you know, so for instance, let me how do I exit this? Okay, so I mean, you can see like that patient has a pretty gnarly abscess. So that doesn't scare me. I think if you scrub it free of debris and then cross hatch the wall of the abscess and infold the tissue to eliminate dead space, if that's all that's necessary. So people have asked me why I don't excise abscess cavities. You know, think of interventional radiology. When you drain a pelvic abscess, they're, they're not removing the abscess cavity. They're merely placing a drain and letting the, bodies, the body itself, you know, soften that area up and eliminate the cavity. Yeah. So I think it's so, unnecessary and it just creates, it, it just creates more dead space. So the back, the back wall, so you remove the top of it and unroof it and then the back wall of the abscess cavity you keep, is that what I'm? Yeah, so in this situation, the, the, the top wall of the abscess is really fixated to the skin. So part of that is removed, but I don't remove the abscess cavity over here. Um, it just gets oh. scrub free and you know, it becomes part of the part of the closure, but the deep portion of the abscess, which in this instance also lay directly down on the sacrum, is is preserved because that fibrous tissue is going to go back to normal once the infection is eliminated. So I use that tissue in the reconstruction. Great. Um. So the next question is, is we have a, a couple more. Um, so uh, Nick S. from Sir John asks, um, how do you calculate the exact dimensions of your incision for the flap? So I think you mentioned that you usually end up going wider than you drew, but how do you calculate it? Okay, so um, let me... So you should look at the CPT book because it tells you how to do it. So in this situation, this island of skin is removed and that is called the primary defect. So you measure from here to the end of, you know, it's gonna end somewhere here and from here to there. And then now that the flap is mobilized, this is the secondary defect. So you measure from here to there and from there to under there. And that gives you the area of the secondary defect. And then you add them together and that becomes your total defect, which is what you bill on. So that's what tells you how many 14302 codes you use because you divide the total. So you take 60 square centimeters, that's your 14301. You take the total defect size, add it to the primary defect size, minus 60, divide by 30, and that gives you the number of 14302 
codes that you're allowed to use. Now, most insurance companies cap it at eight. So even if you bill like 14, you may only get paid on eight. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no. And, I then, and then also do bill the 11772. Most people that do excisional operations, the only code they use is 117 is 11772. And, bec and because the 14302 code is an add-on code, it's not discounted. So you get reimbursed for the full amount of it. Whereas if you did like a colectomy and a, and a cholecystectomy, you get paid for the colectomy, but you get paid 60% of the cholecystectomy. Got it. Uh, if you do it at the same time. So along the same kind of lines uh, as the previous question, Francisco Cardenas asks, how lateral to go to create the flap in extensive sinuses? Like how, how do you know how lateral to go? You mean how far is the flap mobilized? Uh, I'm guessing. So I'm I guessing. Use, it's usually mobilized out to the line of skin contact, which is these dotted lines. Got it. Um, but it's adjusted as I close the deep tissue because sometimes when you close the deep tissue, you notice that there's like some of the skin is, is pulled in and you have to mobilize a little bit more so you don't end up with a pucker. Got it. So the line of, so the line of where what do you call it again? The line of where the, the buttocks come together? So this is this triangular marking is where the buttocks come together. Gotcha. So that's the top of his cleft. That's why my incision is going to go a little bit above that. I don't, this is something I've been doing lately. I don't know that you need to bring this off to the side. You could kind of come up. Tom Baskin just brings it right up to the middle. Um, but he also goes above the cleft. I just, I don't know. I think it looks a little bit better if it's off to the side. Um, and then we have uh, two other questions that have come up. One is from Sir John from Dr. Turahi. How do you manage wound dehiscence? And when you decide this is a non-healing chronic wound and you need to go back to reoperate? Well, I haven't needed to go back to reoperate in a few years now. Um, patients send me, they, they either send me butt selfies or we do butt time. Um, <laughs> they have a, a wound issue, but I'm almost always, these end up going on to heal. I've even had wounds completely fall apart, but because all the dead space is eliminated, um, they end up going on to heal. I usually use Anacept, which is a wound gel that has a bit of Dakin's in it. And I find that it works extremely well. Um, when you have some lower wound separation, it, it often will, it, it takes, it could take a little while, but it almost always goes on to heal. So the extent of what you've had is like almost like superficial dehiscence, but nothing yeah, I mean, I once had an obese patient sit down like too hard uh, the first week of surgery and split her entire wound open. And it took around two months to heal, but it healed and you can't, couldn't even tell that it had separated before. Because I think that if you flatten the cleft and eliminate all the dead space, these wounds always have a, a good chance of healing. And I'm trying to picture that. So if it dehisses and um, it's wide open, because you pulled over, I guess, in the most of the, the patient's left side of their skin and the, and the soft tissue to flap it, even when it heals by secondary tension, there's no cleft, right? Correct. Because you, you've already, because the dead space, you've pulled that left side over. Uh, let me... Let me show you some photos that I'm not totally proud of. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
All right, so this is a patient from Louisiana, rural Louisiana. You can see he developed some lower separation, which completely progressed to yeah. that. Yeah. And it was, I was horrified to that. And then it healed with Anacept. Oh, that was, just, that was an earlier photo. So, and he's fine. And he's back playing football and he's totally fine. That's an earlier photo. So even when bad stuff happens, I so believe in the principles of this procedure that the wounds stand a very, very good chance of healing. And I could have never predicted because this to me looks really good. So I had no idea why that happened, but it did. Yeah. Dr. Tess Olet um, asks, do you have them do any sort of bowel prepping? Uh, no. No. Okay, no bowel prepping needed. And um, I don't think that I don't think the bowel movements contribute to any of the lower wound separations. I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of these are like teenage boys that don't necessarily have good hygiene, but I, I don't have to do a bowel prep. And anyway, I prefer that they have solid stool rather than liquid stool. For sure, I can see why. Um, Tomas Contreras asks, do you prefer any uh, resting position for the post-op uh, one to two days? I, I think you mentioned that there was really no restrictions before, but what is they your- They it right away. Um, and I, I actually think that that helps the flap stick to the bed. So uh, I, I don't think that there's any contraindication to that. Um, you know, I don't want them being super active with a drain in, but I think sitting is fine. And, you know, they can, most patients don't want to, lay on their back because the drain is a little pokey. But I, I don't specifically talk to them about how they should be positioning themselves. That's great that they, you know, unlike some other flaps, we, you know, we tell them to stay off it. That's great that they can go uh, right and sit. Yeah, I mean, so these patients fly in, they typically fly in. I see them in the office on Tuesday. I operate on Wednesday. I see them on post-op day one because I want to make sure that they understand everything about the drain. Uh, I teach the families how to remove the drain. Um, and then they usually fly out that Thursday evening or Friday. So they, you know, they can move around, they can go for walks and stuff. And luckily I've been able to manage every complication, including that last awful wound one over the phone. I've never had to send patients to the hospital. Um, the only patient that I had to have operated on by another surgeon, um, I sent one of my early recurrences to Tom Baskin because I felt so, I, I was too emotionally involved. Um, and I had one patient from Colorado who developed a chronic seroma and I had to have a interventional radiologist put a drain back in and he never stopped draining. So I had to find him a plastic surgeon to get the seroma excised and he ended up being fine because I would have been happy to reoperate on him, but he didn't want to come all the way back to San Francisco. And I apologize as while we're on this subject. Um, one of the Sir John viewers asked, can you just repeat the post-op activity restriction, which basically there, there wasn't any restriction, right? So for, you know, in with the drain in, I don't want them to exercise. Once the drain comes out, I have them cover the, the drain hole with a piece of gauze and switch it to a Band-Aid in a day or two. Um, they usually have very little leakage because I, as I said, I, I tunnel these a fair amount. And then uh, for a month after the drain comes out, I don't want them to sub submerge in water. Um, they probably can, but I don't, that's, this has been my practice. Um, I don't want them to fall on their butt, so I don't let them go snowboarding or skateboarding. And then I just think that riding a bike and deep squats are a bad idea because it puts a lot of mm -hmm. tension on the, on the wound. Sure. But that's all I tell them. I tell them they can lift weights. 
but just know, avoid deep squats. Sure. A couple more questions here as we're wrapping up the hour. Um, Dr. Shrey Modi asks, um, any utility in VAC, uh, in, incisional VAC um, at all? Uh, or one that, so incisional VAC, I guess, right off the bat um, from the procedure, and then also versus using a VAC after wound dehiscence. So um, I, I've never used an incisional VAC. I know that there is good data for it, so it might be useful. And that would be an interesting thing to try. Um, it just, this is a hard area to have a VAC. It's just a difficult area. Um, and certainly the lower part of the incision, which is the one that mostly opens, can't be adequately VAC. It's, it goes all the way down to the anus. Um, many of my patients with failed surgeries have had wound backs, and I don't think that they work for this condition. Um, I have never placed a back on patients like the last one you saw that had had wound separation. So I don't have any experience with it. I just think it's a hard area to have that. And then our last question from Dr. Avery Walker, uh, post-op pain control regimen for these patients, what's your routine? I write them for TID 600 milligram ibuprofen. I give them 18 Percocet tablets. Um, and most of the patients never take the Percocet. I find that most patients have numbness on the flap side. And um, I think the XPRL has really helped post-op pain control. Great. Well, you know, if we, this is the uh, end of the hour here, I think we finished up with any questions. Um, Dr. Sternberg, I just wanna let you know, thank you so much. This is uh, detailing your impressive practice here um, and your expertise. And thank you so much for um, coming out to, to give us a lecture to all the fellows and, and uh, staff here. No, my pleasure. I, I hope it was enjoyable. And we'll be sure to check out your YouTube channel. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Dr. Sternberg. All Take right. Care. Thank you.